everyone and welcome to Women Now. As you know, we usually end the shows with a quote. But for a change, today we are starting with a quote and this is one of my favorites. I want to be judged by my abilities, my struggles and my achievements and not labeled or stereotyped by my gender, my economic background, my nationality or my beliefs. That's exactly what Dr. Fazia Saeed says of herself. She's a development manager, a trainer, facilitator. She's in the media. She's an author as well as a folk culture promoter. She's traveling all the way from Pakistan and she's here to promote one of her books, Dr. Fazia Saeed. It's Hello. such an honor to have you here. Welcome you. to Women Now. Thanks a lot. Now, let's go straight into this. I'm always curious. You grew up in Pakistan. How did you get to who you are today, beating all the odds and just fighting for women's rights and um, just being bold and you personify strength. So tell us all about it. Well, I think that women in South Asia, on one hand, we are discriminated against and on the other hand, we are very strong human beings. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, a, it's a routine for us to go uphill. Mm -hmm. You know, that is how we walk. So we just learned the ways that way. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's also very important to know that we do realize the discrimination, especially when we are being socialized mm -hmm. into young women. Yes. And that is when one learns how to start asking questions. Mm -hmm. And you ask questions from people around you, from your parents, and you start reflecting and critically thinking and realizing what is happening. And for us women, personal is political, political is personal. Right. You know, our lives become the issues that we are fighting for. When you first went out and told everybody that this is what you want to do. You want to fight for the women. Um, you want to stand up for their rights. What were the different challenges that you faced? It was more like even today, I don't think that I see myself fighting for women. Mm -hmm. It's I fight for whatever comes in the way mm -hmm. of my own life. Mm -hmm. And then I realize that that is in the way of many women's lives. Mm -hmm. So it's a collective a, a connection. Mm -hmm. So basically, I sometimes say that I only work for myself because those are the roadblocks that I face. Right. But it just happens to be that it is the roadblock of many other women and we together, we push it aside. So it's very connected with uh, my, my own life and other women's life. And that is what I've been doing. Whatever issue comes in my life, I start working on it, may it be discrimination or harassment, and then it turns out to be other women's issue also and they all join in and we proceed, you know. Right, so you're one of uh, the men, many women who decided to speak up as opposed to many of them who never speak up. So tell us, you've been doing this for the past couple of decades. You started with Bedari. Yes. So tell us about your work with uh, violence against women. It has been, I think, 30 years okay. now. Mm -hmm. that I've been working on violence against women because that somehow comes out to be the most pertinent. You must have started when you were very young then. <laughs> You're still well, that young. <laughs> <laughs> but it is one of the most pertinent issues mm -hmm. and it is a culmination. I would say it's an ugly culmination of a patriarchal system. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have worked on domestic violence, rape related issues, but uh, is it harassment. particularly in your country that you worked on these issues or just all over wherever you work? I, I have worked in many countries mm -hmm. but I have focused on Pakistan because okay. like I said my struggle has been very personal, mm -hmm. personal and political together. Mm -hmm. So I focused in Pakistan and they're, they're actually in Pakistan too sometimes I have focused on the area where I lived, the city that I lived in mm -hmm. and then it spread from there. But sexual harassment is an issue that I think that my work really sort of very, very persistently I followed it mm -hmm. and it culminated into several steps. There is a lot of learning also. You know, initially we used to follow cases mm -hmm. and try to help women out also. And then one realized that uh, following cases doesn't really get you anywhere because mm -hmm. the larger machinery is running the way it's running right. and you know you kind of make your struggle and, and nothing is achieved. So uh, with sexual harassment uh, issue when I started and that was again a very personal experience. Mm -hmm. And when, can you give us a couple of examples, whatever sure. you're comfortable with? Yeah, I was working for the United Nations mm -hmm. in Pakistan mm -hmm. and I experienced sexual harassment consistently I see. Uh, by my bosses. Okay. 
and finally I, I decided to make a formal complaint. And is, was it just by yourself or with a group of other women? The decision was first mine and then gradually a lot of other women I realized were also going through the same thing mm -hmm. and they, they got courage and they said let's do it as a group. Mm -hmm. So we were 11 women who filed against the same guy. Okay. And this was uh, supposedly, you know, International Development Office supposedly following all international norms of uh, non-discrimination, etc. Mm -hmm. But what we found was very surprising. Number one, that it was our silence that kept the guy going. Mm -hmm. You know, because we, we worked together, but we never really talked to each other. Right. I experienced it for three years before I spoke. And Did you I almost even... ignore it as opposed to phasing... Uh, the person who I was think, doing this to you? Uh, my, I, st I started thinking about complaining, but it was lack of uh, any mechanism. Um, I was told that the seniors would not listen to me. Mm -hmm. So there were a lot of people discouraging mm -hmm. and no clarity in terms of how to complain. Okay. And finally I found out that there was an anti-sexual harassment policy. Mm -hmm. And I thought I could use that to make a complaint. And then other women joined me and we were 11 mm -hmm. but what we thought would be as simple as complaining really mm -hmm. turned out to be a whole saga mm -hmm. and I don't want to say more because I I have written that in a form of a book and I would like people to read the whole story but it it really turned out to be the whole management colluding mm -hmm. Mm -hmm and protecting the perpetrator mm -hmm. rather than siding with us. Now let's talk about your book itself, Working with Sharks. Yes. Um, so you've put your thoughts and your experience in the book. Can yes. you give us a bit about it? Well, I have, uh, this is like an autobiographical case study. And it's your third book, right? It is my third book, okay. yes. My first book was Taboo. Mm -hmm. And uh, this one is now published in the United States and mm -hmm. I'm very happy about it because I strongly believe that it is a universal issue. Mm -hmm. Even though my case is of United Nations and my case is focused on Pakistan, mm -hmm. but the dynamics are very similar anywhere. Mm -hmm. And so I have, I have jotted down the whole process and the kind of institutional discrimination we faced. Okay. And this case also I wanted to document because it sparked off a movement in my country and a whole uh, a movement called ASHA. Mm -hmm. It took us about 10 years mm -hmm. to get an anti-sexual harassment policy instituted mm -hmm. into different institutions of the country and also a legislation passed okay. which declares sexual harassment a crime after 60 years. Congratulations <laughs> on that. Yeah, that was much needed, yes. I can tell you. Um, now tell us, where is this book available? I know it's available on Amazon, right? It is available on Amazon. Mm -hmm. It is in hardcover, paperback, Kindle, Nook, so people have the choice. Mm -hmm. But I feel very strongly that uh, women should read it. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure that there is a, you know, the, the issue is very similar. And I also feel like men should read it too. It should not be seen as a woman's issue book because institutional culture is a big thing. And I did see on Amazon that it had five star reviews so okay. this is surely a read for me. Um, and uh, before we let you go, what is your two cent for every woman who face this on a daily basis? Okay, I think number one we, we have to be brave mm -hmm. and a lot of our issues do not get highlighted because we doubt ourselves and we say maybe nobody would believe it but mm -hmm. I think it's time that women should really come out. Mm -hmm and regardless of how the system treats it. And the other thing I want to say is that it is very important for women to speak out, but it is also very important for the rest of the society to create that safe space for women. So right. the burden should not be only on women. The society needs to really help out a lot. Well, thank you so much. Again, it was an honor to have you here, Dr. Fazia Saeed. Thank, thank you. you. Watching America's first South Asian TV talk show. Don't go away. Women Now will be right back.
watching America's first South Asian TV talk show, Women Now. Let's get back to the show. Now, where can you hang out with VCs and startups in a rather classy atmosphere? Right here at the Startup Demo Plus Pitch. And we're reporting to you directly from Drake SF. We're now talking with the founder of Applause, Mr. Jose Di Gios, and Applause is the main sponsor of this event. Now, Jose, tell us, why concentrate on 25 companies as opposed to something large scale? Right, so the, the premise behind 25 companies is 25 is a good number. It's a quarter of 100, right? And so what we do is we give 25 entrepreneurs the opportunity to come down here, demo their product. Of those 25, the investors go and they pick a certain amount, whether it's five or ten, to pitch, to pitch them here in this room. This is a wonderful room for that. So, and uh, did you have to go with a classy setting for the 25 companies as opposed to uh, maybe having it in an expo hall? W so what's the theme behind this? Good question. So the reason that we do it in this classy setting is, of course, we want to bring class to the startup world. But these poor folks, you know, they, they really work very, very hard on their projects and they don't have a lot of money. A lot of them are bootstrapping this. They're, they're paying it out of their own pocket. So what we wanted to do is bring them into a setting that brings their spirit up. I mean, you walk into this establishment, the Drake SF, by the way, is a great host here. You walk into this establishment and immediately you're like, oh my goodness, this is beautiful. It's a great place, a great place to demo, right? And so instead of doing it at some hall, um, we wanted to do it in this establishment. Now, the beautiful thing about this establishment is everyone comes in and they order a drink. They get to socialize as opposed to it being a stuffy kind of ex hall kind of a thing. You get to socialize with people. You get to go ahead and talk to the different uh, uh, startups about their business and just make it more personal, right? So that's why we chose this place. So tell us, what is that one specific thing that you're looking, in, looking for in companies today? I'm looking for a serial entrepreneur. I bet the jockey, not the horse. I want to see a management team where at least half the people involved have done it before, from uh, initial incubation of an idea to an exit event of some sort. So do you think there's some kind of um, entrepreneur attraction, if I may? Uh, do you believe in somebody who's been there, done that, who looks very wise as opposed to a 19-year-old kid who's just out of college and has a really cool, brilliant idea? I'd be willing to bet on a 19-year-old kid who has a really cool idea. If they're a Steve Jobs or a Bill Gates or a Mark Zuckerberg type of person who's really passionate, really committed, and definitely a subject matter expert in what they're pitching. Tell us about your company. So we have a company called Robit, and it is a do-it-yourself distribution platform for film, TV, music, books, video games, and comics. And uh, you're obviously here to look for an investor. Other than just the investment part of it, uh, what else are you here for? Actually, to introduce herself to San Francisco, since this is only our second time here in about a year and a half. Where are you based on? Based out of LA. Okay. So we're kind of coming north, which is good. Yeah, something a little different. Yeah, and yes, we are here to uh, meet investors and let them know about what we do. Jill, tell us about your company. Hi, we're Dragon Girls High Flash Collective, and we make a remedy that will replace high flash medication as it is now. Our competition is pill form. Pill form medication takes a, it uses a lot of chemicals that after long periods of time give you serious side effects. Our remedy has none of those chemicals. It's fast, it's topical, it's effective, and it's something that we believe will make a complete replacement in the current prescription medication for hot flashes. So is this going to be your pitch to the investors too, today? Yes. Okay. So do you really believe in the eight second rule that you know you impress an investor in eight, eight second um, period of time or do you, do you like it more descriptive like this? Um, there are different ways. Um, a eight second pitch is really good because it keeps you on point so that you could talk about the really strong points of your business. Um, a long, more discussion gives you more information about the product. So um, my, my product, uh, our business, is part of a collective, and we work with membership. So a more descriptive kind of a pitch would help us to get grow our membership. So Manny, you're an investor. Tell me, what is a great company for you? 
in a very early stage when they were getting started. We invest in early stage startups. Realty Shares is one of our most recent investments, and we like them because they actually gained some traction before they went out and raised money. Okay. And is there a certain quality in a company that you look for? Is it the team, the product, um, the service, or just their pitch? Large markets. Get into huge markets and want to exploit it early. Then have a team that will actually execute on the skills that are needed. I think that's a good two qualities. You get past that, then there's other things. Now there has been ups and downs in the economy as all of us know. Where is investment heading these days? What's hot? You know, I'm a, still a strong believer in real estate. I'm a big real estate investor and uh, we diversify our portfolio with early stage startups. Um, right now crowdfunding platforms are hot, but I'm not one to give investment advice. Okay you guys, so if you're an investor or a startup, you know exactly where to hang out every month. Yep, you heard it right. This event is every month. And if you need more information about this event, you can get on our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash Women Now TV. Now the party has just begun, so I'm heading back. Until next time, bye bye. America's first South Asian TV talk show. Don't go away. Women Now will be right back. You're watching America's first South Asian TV talk show. Women Now. Let's get back to the show. Now, can you ever get bored of movies or Bollywood? Bollywood never loses its flavor. You and I know that. And to talk about some insider secrets of Bollywood, we have none other than superstar Jimmy Shergill with us. Jimmy, welcome to Women Now. Let's go straight to your career. What got you into Bollywood? How did you start? I did my acting classes with Mr. Roshan Taneja uh, uh, in 1993. Then I was there for about one and a half years. Then I got a, a small role in a film called Marches. Guldhar Sahib, uh, I think, is an institution, uh, you know, when it comes to acting and uh, filmmaking and stuff like that. And he, had, he said some really interesting things at that point of time, which I've always, uh, you know, kept them in the back of my mind and always tried to, uh, you know, uh, put them in use wherever it's, uh, it, it, it applies. And uh, he said something like, uh, never let the fate of any movie become your fate. As in, like, if the film is a very big hit, don't let it get into your head and you know you start behaving weirdly and stuff like that and even if it if a film is is uh, is a flop then also don't let it become your fate move on are there certain challenges that you face on a day-to-day -day basis just being a star challenges come with every film yeah. you you say yes to most of the films that you're doing is because of the fact that you feel that the character that you're portraying in that particular film of all the movies that you've acted so far, what would be that one movie that you would love to reenact again? Well, it, it definitely has been the Sahib BV Gangster series because that's totally not me as, as a person. And uh, Sahib is very... Uh, uh, he's, he's good in his own way, but he's evil also in his own way. And uh, there is uh, a lot of excitement to that particular character. It's a tough character. Any film that you do with Digmanshu is always a challenge. So I feel I'm looking forward to the third part now and uh, they're still working on the script and next year we should be uh, um, shooting for the film. And uh, yes, it has, um, I mean, it's created an amazing kind of response from the audiences all over like even right now that I'm here in the US and every single person I meet just talks about that film and my character in that and stuff like that so I'm excited for the third part. In terms of movies itself what's coming up next for you? Well uh, my next release uh, should be Bullet Raja which is directed by Tigman Tigman Dhulia again and has uh, Saif Ali Khan and Sonakshi. Mm -hmm. 
it's a big film for me and uh, got a very nice character uh, in in this one also i'm looking forward to it so it's a story about uh, these two friends it's based on true incidents and it's a lovely film two two friends and what happens and it is definitely a masala film it is a full on entertainer and it's a kind of a, a political cum gangster kind of film. we can't wait to watch it so wish you the best in everything that you're doing for the community and bollywood good luck